And the first part of my title is The Underground Lives of Badgers. And so that's been what my research has been focusing on. I've been trying to get an idea of what badgers do underground, yes, but also what role the set plays in badgers' lives, how it influences them as individuals, and how it influences their societies. And I think the best part to start answering this question of what role do sets play for badgers is at the beginning, the very beginning, about 35 million years ago. So this is a period when the Earth was in uh, what's called the Eocene Climatic Optimum. It was a warm, stable environment, subtropical, really warm temperatures. Um, but 35 million years ago, that uh, stable climate uh, underwent a period of climate change, and it shifted to a very cold and dry environment. Uh, what was a 5 degree difference between summer and winter across the globe changed to a 25 degree one. Uh, so it was a major period of climate change. A number of species during that period went extinct. Uh, but for those that didn't, they needed to find a means of coping with this environmental change. And it's during that period of environmental change that we see the greatest emergence of burrowing animals in the fossil record. And from their humble beginnings as little refugia from harsh weather, uh, burrow dependency and complexity uh, rapidly evolved. And badgers are a prime example of one of those burrowing animals with a high uh, dependency on the underground environment. Uh, they overwinter below ground, and that can be up to 180 days in some of the more northern parts of their range in Russia. Their young are born underground and spend up to the first eight weeks below ground. And when all is said and done, they can spend up to about 70% of their lives underground. So the underground environment plays a crucial part in their biology. And my goal uh, over the course of my doctorate was to try and find out what that role was. Now, I did my work in Whiteham Woods, uh, which is this wood woodland up here, just north of Oxford, about four and a half miles north of Oxford. Um, and in that area, I focused on a number of social groups that we have up in the northern part of the woods. In the woods themselves, we have 23 different groups. Uh, the groups I worked on are uh, termed FB, GAH, CHO. Uh, so you may see those uh, letters floating around just uh, an acronym that we use to identify these groups. And so I focused on uh, three of the main sets in that area and the different outliers, and I tried to identify the role that those sets played uh, in these badgers' lives, their movements below ground, and their movements above ground. And as I've said, to do that, I used these wonderful collars. Um, you'll notice that they're, they're quite light, but that's not to say that they're empty. There's a lot going on in there. Uh, there's three main components, though, that I will be presenting today. And the, one of them is a three-dimensional accelerometer. And so what this does is it measures how the collar is moving in space, how it's rotating and um, moving um, generally. And so that gives me both a measure of activity, whether or not the animal is active, but also behavior. If you know how it's rotating, you can decide whether or not the animal is running whether or not it's scratching, whether it's interacting with others, for example. A second component, and this is the brand new bit, is a magneto-inductive tracking component. Uh, it sounds quite complicated, but really what it is, is it uses a series of magnetic waves to track the animal below ground. Now, traditional technologies such as GPS or radio waves uh, struggle to find animals below ground, and they struggle um, both in their accuracy and in the frequency that you can uh, sample. Um, so you get very, very low uh, resolution uh, accuracy of where the animals are, and it takes you a lot of time to generate those fixes. So you get a very poor um, understanding of what's going on below ground. Whereas this new technology, as you'll see later on in the talk, really gives a fantastic crystal clear picture of what's going on. And the third component is uh, traditional radio uh, RFID radio frequency identification. Uh, and what that is, is it uses radio waves to try and track the animal above ground. So when all said and done, uh, when I put a collar on one of my badgers, I can know what it's doing, where it's doing this above ground, and where it's doing this below ground. So you get it, and it samples automatically at really high frequency, so it samples eight times a second. And so I know essentially for an entire day, over the course of about four months to five months, what these animals are doing. So I'm going to start by presenting some of the findings that I found using these three-dimensional accelerometers, so the activity and behavioral data. 
And one of the things that I was really uh, interested in answering was, uh, how is the set used to protect these animals from harsh weather? Uh, now, so, as uh, protection from harsh weather it goes, the most crucial period for badgers, I believe, um, is autumn. It's a period when they're switching from the above ground being warmer than the, uh, the below ground environment to a situation where the above ground temperatures are colder than the below ground environment. So it's this transition period, and it's during this transition period that you see the most interesting forms of behavior uh, and adaptations to the underground environment. So I sampled him over the unatomial, four autumnal periods actually, and as I said, it samples eight times a second. Mine worked for about four months, and that was about 35 million measures per animal. So billions of data points. Uh, I have about 35 different animals collared. So huge, huge uh, amount of data, but huge resolution of understanding what's going on. What this data looks like on the short term uh, is something like sound wave. And if you pair that up with observations of what the animals are doing, you can see that these signals, like this one here, is related to running, which you might have just seen in that video. Whereas this one here might be uh, associated with, for example, scratching or um, grooming one another. But in addition to being able to tell on the short term what they're doing, I can also tell on the long term how they're uh, distributing that behavior over the course of a day. So here you can see the day, uh, day in the life of one badger in terms of accelerometer readings. Um, and you'll see uh, this big gap, uh, low points during the middle of the day when the animal is sleeping. And around 6 o'clock in the evening, it wakes up, and you see these peaks in activity. But you also see breaks uh, over the course of the night as well. Uh, quite a few of them, actually, and they're very common, uh, sometimes lasting 30 minutes, sometimes lasting up to two hours. Um, so from that, I can get an idea of uh, how <coughs> different animals are distributing their activity over the course of the night, and also how long they're active on each on a night-to-night -night basis. And it's, there's uh, a lot of differences uh, from one night. They can be active for three or four hours on one night and up to about 12 hours on another night. But why? Well, uh, as I said, autumn is, a, is a, that period where there's a change occurring in the environment. And uh, badgers are nocturnal, as we're all aware. And over the course of the autumn, night length is increasing. And so for a nocturnal animal, that's great. It gives them more time to go out and forage uh, and uh, interact with other individuals in the environment. Um, and you would expect them to be active for an extended period of time. But, as I said earlier, it's also a period of time when it's getting colder. And the colder it gets, the less time they'll want to spend above ground because it's just energetically costly for them to maintain their body temperature in those cold conditions. And so what you see is, uh, as, as you progress uh, into later autumn, a period when they spend less and less time above ground. Uh, and it's just energetically not beneficial for them to be above ground. And they start to move into that torpid period. And so they're using the set uh, then to maintain that uh, warm environment that they can use to balance the difference. And uh, so I think these numbers are very, very important, and we'll just go over them each in detail. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's just to say that you can then use those activity measures to build some models to really get a very, very clear picture of what's going on in these badgers' lives. And this is a number of different models for a number of different animals or a number of different years. And Consistently, what comes out as the big drivers of badger behavior are solar radiation, so that's a measure of whether or not it's night or day, which is pretty clear, but also the rainfall, temperature, and the humidity of the soil. Uh, and so those are basically the key drivers of badger behavior. And why that is, is as I mentioned earlier, the costs of being above ground in cold environments, but also uh, badger's diet. Now badgers, as many people might be aware, are uh, opportunistic omnivores, so they'll eat just about anything they come across. But they love worms. They love earthworms. It's their main uh, source of food, um, but earthworms are also very susceptible to climatic conditions. And so they're uh, conditions where earthworms, for example, warm temperature but rainy, you'll get a nice number of earthworms, but warm temperature and dry, you'll get fewer earthworms. Uh, cold temperature and rainy, you might get some earthworms, cold temperature and dry. Uh, you get fewer earthworms, and, and again, it's costly for the animal to be above ground, regulating their body temperature. And so 
what results is that the burrow, the set, is a fantastic environment for balancing the benefits of being active and above ground, I mean, i.e. the amount of earthworms that are going to be there, and the cost of being active, so maintaining that body temperature under cold environments. And the set is a, is a great environment for just uh, balancing that budget. But not only am I able to tell what individuals are doing, uh, sorry, what the population is doing, what, what a badger is doing, I can tell what badgers are doing, so what different individuals are doing within the population. So this is three different animals on the same night, and you can see there's no similarity at all between any of them. So for example, the animal that I showed earlier wakes up sometime around 6.30. Uh, this animal, uh, another animal from the exact same social group, wakes up about 40 minutes later and uh, shows no breaks over the course of the night. Similarly, you get another animal that wakes up even half an hour later than that, and has a huge number of breaks over the course of the night. So there's big differences between different badgers uh, in both the time that they emerge from the set and also the amount of time that they spend uh, above ground and active, and also the number of breaks that they're taking. So why is that? Um, well, so I investigated the relationship between how long they were active and you'll see this log mass, log length. So that's their body condition. So basically how much fat they're able to build up. And higher along this means better condition. Now, unfortunately, uh, when I did these early studies, I had a very small sample size. I only had four animals in one year. But the trend was pretty clear. It seemed that fatter badgers were actually less active. So when it's cold above ground, and the, there's not very, there aren't very many earthworms, those uh, animals that are in better condition actually tend to spend more time below ground because they're able to live off their fat stores and enter a period of torpor in the warm burrow. But unfortunately for those thinner badgers that are desperate to feed, uh, they actually have to maintain uh, above ground activity for extended periods of time. So this is actually about a one and a half hour difference, but uh, it could be uh, up to two and a half hours difference on a night to night basis based purely on uh, their own physical condition. Um, so some take home messages from that. Badgers are definitely strategic in how they spend their energy. They're not just uh, doing, will, doing anything willy nilly. They're, they're very strategic in what they do and how they spend that energy in, in different behaviors above ground and below ground. And sets are most definitely used to balance the budget. So when they have a negative budget above ground, they'll definitely use the below ground environment to try and turn that into a positive budget. Great. So sets are used to balance that budget, and badgers are active. Uh, the badger's activity is dictated by weather. That's really interesting in terms of biology, but it actually has some very important practical implications. And one of the things that it influences greatly, uh, as I've found over the course of my PhD, is our ability to monitor these populations. And that's because Monitoring uh, typically is done by a capture mark recapture process. So you capture the animals, and you mark them with some type of identification, and then you recapture them. If you find the animal that has been marked, you know that uh, you're not adding to the population. Whereas if you find another new animal that hasn't been marked, you can then add an, um, another animal to the population. And you know that you're, you can then you can build these into models and just uh, predict how many animals there are in the local area. But all of these models and all these techniques and mathematical techniques uh, assume that how much effort you put in will be directly proportional to the number of animals that you'll be able to observe. Spend 10 hours out in the field, you'll see 10 badgers. Spend 100 hours out in the field, you'll see 100 badgers. But really, that's not the case at all. Um, in fact, how the animals are behaving is going to play a huge factor into how many animals you'll be able to observe. Uh, no matter how much effort you may put in, if you're trapping or even camera trapping or just sitting out watching, if you're doing it under terrible conditions, you won't see a single badger. However, if you're doing it under great conditions, you might see every badger that's in that little area. Uh, so how the animals are behaving factors into how many you'll be able to observe hugely. And one of the things that influences that uh, is season. So for example, some, some seasons we've found are very, very good for trapping badgers, others are very poor. Uh, the best tends to be summer, you get pretty good numbers, but also these error bars you see are very, very low, so you get a lot less variability in the number of animals that you'll trap. 
Autumn, on the other hand, medium numbers, not particularly low, but a huge amount of variability in the number of animals that you'll catch. Uh, up from about 50 to 55 percent of the population we found, down to as low as about 20 percent of the population. Huge, huge difference. And winter is, is really just a terrible time to try and do it at all. Now, you'll remember I said earlier that how the condition, uh, the condition that these animals are in affects how long they'll be active. So those animals that are in good condition tend to be active for less time, whereas those animals that are in poor condition tend to be active for extended periods of time. That actually factors into our ability to trap them as well. Um, so from our 30 years of trapping data, I was able to pull together this graph. And so this is their body condition on the bottom. And you'll see that as the population is in better condition, you're catching fewer and fewer and fewer animals. Um, again, building some of these models from these predictions, uh, I was able to determine what the main factors are uh, predicting our ability to trap these animals. And apart from season, which is also important, body condition, what condition the population is in plays a huge, huge role in our ability to trap them and monitor them properly. But also, you'll see rainfall and temperature, but this is six to eight weeks prior and four to six weeks prior. So this is two months before the actual trapping event has occurred. That's what's driving our ability to trap them. And in fact, rainfall during the trapping and temperature during the trapping are the least uh, influential predictors overall. And this is what I showed you earlier about different seasonal effects. If you factor in the weather into that as well, you get about a 10% difference in trapping efficiency efficiency based purely on good conditions versus poor conditions, um, weather conditions. And it, under the best of years, you get much, much better trapping efficiency than under the uh, worst of years. And as I mentioned earlier, some of those models uh, that you use to then find out how many animals are actually in the area, while well, they don't take into account variability in trapping. Um, so this green line that you see here this is our long-term data, and we know that it's accurate. It's been tested against uh, the genetic uh, profile of the population. We know that we trap every single animal in that population. So this is a very, very accurate estimate of how many animals are in that, those woods. But I ran some simulations uh, based and, and tried to get an estimate of what the population size would be if we only did a very, very short-term analysis, and unfortunately it was done under either very, very good conditions, weather conditions for trapping badgers, or very, very poor conditions. And it made a, made a huge impact. And you'll see here that if you do a one-year study uh, of trying to trap these animals under the absolute worst conditions, you get very, much, much lower uh, population estimates than there actually are animals. Conversely, if you trap them under the best conditions possible for trapping badgers, you get much, much higher estimates. And actually, there's about a four-fold difference between these lower estimates and these higher estimates. And what's even more interesting is that if you continue to work under poor conditions, you drive those estimates even lower because of the way that you influence the bottom half, the denominator of this formula, um, but without influencing the number of actual animals that you trap. So you drive those estimates into the ground. And only a two-year study under the absolute best of conditions, absolute best, best weather conditions at all times, can you get an estimate that rivals our long-term uh, numbers. Now I think, uh, it might become clear after saying that that there's some pretty significant practical implications of that. Now, uh, so this is um, an older slide of mine. It does, doesn't factor in newer numbers, but uh, the Cullen uh, 2014 set a 70% removal target, and I think everybody's well aware of the fact that that didn't work. Um, no, no, uh, I think it was widely seen as, as a failure. And there was no real understanding as to why those numbers weren't achieved and why it was a failure. And you, see, you saw quotes around of badgers move the goalposts, and uh, we had to call off this trapping, uh, this culling operation because of bad weather. And what that tells me is that there's really no scientific understanding as to what they're doing and to why it went wrong. And ultimately, that comes back to our ability to generate accurate population estimates, which I've shown you here is highly influenced by the weather, and then our subsequent ability to get accurate estimates of how many badgers you're going to be able to trap at that period, which again 
is related entirely to weather. Uh, so the weather has a huge, huge influence in this. Um, but not only am I able to use this technology to then in, uh, get an idea of how badgers, uh, how, how our ability to monitor badgers is influenced by weather, but I'm also able to project how badgers are going to do against specific climate change scenarios. So you can use those readings that I mentioned before and those models that I built uh, and those uh, what's called parameter estimates from those models. And I can use climate change projection for the UK uh, over the next 100 years based on the International Panel of Climate Change projections and combine those to get an idea of how badgers are going to respond to climate change. And uh, so I did that. And this is kind of the results that I've been seeing. And what you see is this area here, this line here, is how badgers are responding to their environment in the current uh, climate, the climatic conditions. There's a decrease in the amount of time that they're active and a decrease in the energy that they're spending on a night-to-night -night basis as the autumnal period progresses. It's what you'd expect uh, in badgers at this latitude. It's what they've been doing for a while. Uh, they're just slowly moving through a torpid period. But under climate change conditions, uh, the weather is going to be good enough, warm enough for them to stay above ground for extended periods of time. And you'll see that high level of activity, uh, long nights uh, and lot, quite a bit of activity, intercept movements, etc., being maintained well into the winter months. And that leads to a huge change in what they would experience, what they might experience, and what they're currently experiencing. And I've calculated it as about a 40% energy, a 40% increase in the amount of energy they're going to be requiring on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, we know right now that badgers are able to maintain these elevated levels of activity. They're not going to be more active than they're uh, currently active. Um, let's say uh, a badger in August is going to be active at one level, um, and that activity is not abnormal that you might see in, in November for a badger. It's just abnormal for that season. Um, so we know that they're able to maintain uh, that energy expenditure, but we just don't know whether they'll be able to maintain it during that winter season. And the reason for that is because um, while, yes, badgers eat a lot of earthworms, over the course of uh, their uh, spring, summer, and late autumn life history, they've got a lot of seasonal food that can supplement their diet. Uh, so berries, for example, nuts, and farm crops. But over the winter period, uh, they won't have those uh, additional seasonal food items that they can supplement their diet with. And so that might be a really big challenge for them. So energy expenditure over uh, the next, this is predicted for the next 100 years or so, was going to be a huge challenge for badgers. But not just energy expenditure, that increased activity is also factoring into uh, the rate of a human uh, con conflict with humans. And actually what we've noticed so far is when we uh, project these uh, climate change scenarios into the future, uh, and if we use our, our 30 years of trapping and monitoring data, we found that as temperatures are increasing, badgers are increasingly getting hit. Uh, on, on, we're, we're seeing greater increase in, in RTAs, and badgers are being hit by cars more often. And the reason uh, links back to, again, them being uh, influenced by weather. And so as, as winter temperatures are becoming increasingly warm, Badgers are increasingly more active during winter months, and it's driving RTAs right through the roof because you have a period where nights are long, which allows them to be active for extended periods of time, but you also have a period where it's becoming warmer as well. So those extended periods of activity are increasing more than they might be in summer, and RTAs are actually being driven through the roof by warmer temperatures. And are actually, temperature is the main predictor of uh, RTAs. So the take-home message from that is that climate change is definitely increasing their conflict with humans, and the predicted weather changes uh, over the next century uh, are definitely going to change the dynamics of their normal seasonal cycle, and it might put their populations uh, under challenging conditions. Um, so I'm about halfway through now, and if anybody would like to go up and take a drink, if you want me to uh, pause and stop, do say so. Okay. Also, I'm about halfway through and I'm about to shift to a different aspect of their lives. Uh, so if anyone has any questions on that climate stuff, do feel free to ask. What's, uh, what's good weather for badgers then, for trapping them? 
Uh, so the best weather for trapping them is actually dry and warm. So dry and warm means that you get fewer, uh, the animals can't get as many worms, and so they're desperate for food and will enter traps more, more uh, readily. And that's up to two months prior to trapping. Up to two months prior, yeah. yeah. And actually, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the numbers from last year's call, but they were better. And last year we saw conditions that were significantly drier than the previous years. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the people um, organizing these things didn't quite make the link. And although our work is published, you know. <laughs> so you want, you want a dry period, but then presumably you would make, ensure that you don't get a wet trap at night, because that would be Yeah, it bad. could influence, exactly. Yeah, that's the first main. Yeah, yeah. Sort of risk. yeah okay. And the interesting thing in terms of monitoring these populations is actually, as the badgers are doing better, if they're in better condition, you're less likely to trap them. And so as the population might be growing, you're actually driving your estimates down. Versus the flip side is when they're in poor condition and the population might be doing very poorly, you're driving your conditions up because all those animals are desperate for food and entering these traps uh, more readily. And so unless you're monitoring for an extended period of time, I think you really have to be aware of the fact that your estimates are not going to be accurate. Yeah. Can I just ask you about wind influencing mm -hmm. uh, worms coming out at mm -hmm. night? We, many years ago, we had a student working with a badger group and we helped him with worm sampling. Um, and we, we noticed that we weren't getting as many worms on the wind side of hills. Mm -hmm. have, have you found that? I haven't looked at it, um, mm -hmm. but it's definitely something that I think will factor into the... Yeah, maybe it brings the temp drives the temperature mm -hmm. down. It, it definitely drives the temperature yeah. down of the soil surface based on pure wind chill. It's going to influence the evaporation rate mm -hmm. of the soil as well, so how much water is going to be available. And it also influences for the badgers themselves, if it's a windy night, uh, it's more challenging if it's colder, you know, they might not be able to stay above ground for an extended period of time. So it does factor in. Um, unfortunately, it's just not something I've been able to look at yet. Okay. With, with your sample site sets, mm -hmm. what's the predominant um, habitat type outside the woodland? So is it sort of arable or it's it's pasture? all uh, it's it's all pasture land. Uh, pasture. Pasture. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cow and sheep pasture. So there's no sort of. Uh, there's some arable land, but not. It's not prominent then within the It's range. I'll say it's a mix of arable and pasture. Um, <clears throat> certain areas of the woods are bordered by pasture. Certain yeah. are bordered by arable, okay. so certain groups have entire access, their access is yeah. entirely to pasture, whereas yeah. certain groups is entirely arable. Okay. Yeah, so it's a bit of a mix. Yeah. Does your correlation between badger throat traffic accidents and temperature, mm -hmm. climate, factor in number of vehicles, increase of vehicles on the roads, and more roads being built, and more roads for them to get killed on? Uh, it definitely factors in traffic. It doesn't factor in number of roads because this was done just in our study area and um, the, the roads haven't increased. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but it does factor in traffic as well. And it actually, what's also important for badgers is the time change. Yes. Yeah. That's a big period when um, they get caught out. They and, and shift working. Yeah, exactly. People didn't used to work at night in the numbers that they did and yeah. moved around mm -hmm. a lot in North Africa at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of factors, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the main thing is, I mean, temperature is driving them to be yeah. more active, more yeah. far-ranging on those if nights. If they were okay, they'd be underground. Or exactly. Be if it was a normal winter, you would expect yeah. them. Yeah. You wouldn't expect them to be out in no. those periods, no. and they wouldn't be exposing themselves to those risks. Mm. So on that basis, that it's the thin badgers that are hungry, which are more active and are foraging more, mm -hmm. would that factor into... Badgers that are being trapped in the cold zones are likely to be the ones which are sickly, but the healthy ones are staying on the ground. Does that need to be? Um, I wouldn't answer that mm. because I personally don't know to what extent uh, bovine tuberculosis influences badgers' status, their health status. Mm. They're heavily in, uh, infected by all sorts of parasites, all sorts of diseases. Um, my personal feeling is that bovine tuberculosis is just something else uh, on top of it. 
and that it won't influence their body condition in that sense. Um, but it's very under-researched. Um, so it may factor in. I believe that it might not, but I won't give a firm answer because I can't say. Did you factor it? Obviously you did, but um, you made the, the three individual badges, the tracking like, mm -hmm. scans. What, what influence did gender have? None. 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 Yeah, surprisingly. <laughs> Did you um, test any of the old badges that you um, caught? For uh, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, none of the badges that I will be presenting data from uh, have or had tuberculosis, um, but we do have it in our population. I don't know. What sort of percentage? Very low, two, one, one or two. It's very, it's new. It's emerging into the population. Uh, how long did you have the collars on uh, with the badges? Uh, the f I was recording them for about a year. Yeah. Uh, sorry, about five months, but the collar was on for about a year. Okay. When, when you fitted the collars, after did you notice? Did you start monitoring their patterns immediately? Yeah. And if you did, did you notice? Um, a change after a few days I and mean, was it apparent that they were stressed it, by it actually it was yeah. Um, yeah there was about uh two to three hour decrease in their nightly activity for what period, for a period of about three days really yeah okay yeah. so there's obviously there is some influence there are yeah i mean do to them <laughs> and to days. what extent this might be uh the sedative that we use or to what uh, extent? Yes, of course, because you're, yeah, okay. But also yeah, so the fact of being in a, in a trap, yeah. and then, uh, yeah. so they're, they're up all night, mm -hmm. but then when they should be resting, they're also awake because they're in the trap and we have to yeah, monitor right. them for three hours after yeah. we sedate them. So they're essentially not getting, mm. 20, they're going about 24 hours yeah. without sleep. Because we're trapping badges and then we're sort of, not, we're leaving them away, we're not seeing them again. Right. And I would, I would have anticipated the fact that you, stay at that set all night the next night and you wouldn't see a badger because they would be right. one tired and also the stress factor so perhaps we might try that what? might try and see what's happening <laughs> mm. have you learned very much about best um, sites for traps um it's not something we've investigated uh we do something a little different where we are and so we just put as many traps as possible <coughs> at a set we, we do what's called saturation trapping so we've got records of how many animals we know for sure at that site we put way more than enough traps in that area uh, and we put them at entrance holes and we put them on paths and we essentially border off the set and so i don't think it's anything that would be applicable to something uh, of a different scale and don't they become trap shy no <laughs> The opposite. <laughs> How they like them? We've caught some animals 26 times over the course of their life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If they're caught as a cub, uh, they tend to do all right, and they don't become trap shy over the course of their lives. They become uh, quite familiar with it. Okay. How would the clan know the difference between a badger which had been shot and killed by colours and one which had been run over by a car? I was talking about the perturbation theory. Right. Not really changing. Yeah. But you'll see some interesting bits on their social lives in a bit, which put perturbation into question. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you find um, different food in the trap work better? <sighs> not really. Uh, peanuts tends to work very well for us, but we have a population that is not trap shy. Yeah. Um, if we're getting instances where they are quite trap shy, We'll put a little golden syrup in there as well. That tends to help. It just attracts them by smelling strongly. Um, occasionally, we've tried dog food to really entice them. Uh, but the problem with dog food is you get everything, including cats and dogs in there, like foxes. A anything that's in the woods would be attracted to that. Um, so, And even at that, we didn't really notice an increase in our number of badgers. Yeah, so 
peanuts tends to do well, and if you're really struggling, peanut control from syrup. Got a bit of a sweet tooth. <laughs> right, so before uh, we go on for ages with this, I think it's best to take a next, next step forward in our, in our story. So you'll see, remember these images from earlier. I mentioned that evolution of burrowing in badgers was, uh, sorry, evolution of burrowing animals generally was related to the evolution uh, to the climate change uh, that happened about 35 million years ago. Well, a study that I produced earlier, uh, probably about six months ago now, um, also found that for carnivores, there was a huge, uh, strong, very strong relationship between the evolution of burrowing and the evolution of group, li group living. And so those animals that tended to burrow and excavate uh, burrows and live in them over the course of their lives also tended to be more social than those that lived above ground. And that's a uh, thing you see in badgers. Um, you know, badger societies tend to be centered around their sets, and sets play a huge, huge part of their social life. So in Whiteham, as I mentioned earlier, we have about 23 social groups uh, over a four and a half square kilometer area, 279 different set sites in the woods. Uh, that's an average of about 12.1 for territory, uh, 1,100 entrance holes within the woods, and some of these sets are massive. They have got about 50 or more entrance holes. 80% um, of those 1,100 entrance holes are active, uh, so that means that they are cleared of debris. About half of them, 50% or so, have fresh boil on them, so they're uh, actively digging these uh, sets up. And so clearly, huge amount of underground space and also well-maintained underground space is important for badger societies. And so that's something that I tried to investigate. But what exactly are badger societies? Well, if you open up any textbook, you'll see badger societies are, um, uh, badgers live in groups, they're territorial, and their societies are centered around their sets, and these territories are marked off by a series of paths and latrines. Um, but to keep a very long story short, we produced a lot of evidence, uh, our groups produced a lot of evidence to say that that might be an oversimplification oversimplification of the story that's actually going on. And so that was another part of my research, was to try and understand, really, what are badger societies? And so the first thing I investigated was, do badgers mark out territories? And to do this, you typically do a bait marking survey. Um, many of you might be familiar with the process. What you do is deploy colored bait at the different sets, and then you survey the site for latrines that have the colored bait. And when you see green or red or blue or yellow, you can link that back to the set that you put that colored bait, and you can link it back and mark it out, map it out, and see the territory. And what you would expect from that is, over the course of the entire landscape, a series of latrines uh, that mark out different borders, and these borders don't overlap, and um, badger societies are neatly packed into their, ter into their landscape. So that's what I did. Uh, I went out and I fed my badgers colored beads and uh, looked for the latrines and um, plugged all that data uh, into my statistical software, uh, ran it through, and I got a mess. <laughs> <laughs> There's absolutely no evidence of strict territorial borders here at all. But maybe I'm doing something wrong. So if I didn't find that, why are all these studies finding non-overlapping territory? Well, the answer is, they are. So there's actually, the, the, the protocol associated with mapping these territories is when you find a latrine that is an outlier, uh, that doesn't map to a territory properly, you just delete it. And you rerun the analyses until you get a pattern that looks like a territory. And so it no, might not be that mine was different, it's just that um, these, the, the traditional te uh, statistical technique towards determining these territories uh, is encouraged to find these territories. You're encouraging yourself to try and find a territory where it might not be uh, evident. And in fact, when I used that process, uh, the same traditional process, that's exactly what I found. Uh, very strict territory borders, uh, typically non-overlapping, and they pack together nicely in the, in the landscape. Uh, so a bit of a take-home message from that is that the ability to map territories is highly dependent on the statistical technique that we use and our methodological approach. Um, 
So I believe that it's illogical to then uh, jump to territoriality based on the positions of these latrines alone. And actually, when you look into the function of latrines more than the actual position of them, uh, we found that latrines are typically, rather than a sign that says keep out, uh, they're more of a Badger Facebook. And <laughs> Badgers will use them as a way of uh, advertising both their reproductive status um, and their individual status, what they've been eating recently, uh, who they've been hanging around with, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll notice from these uh, bar graphs here, uh, females tend to spend a very large amount of time investigating uh, both males that are uh, reproductively active and not, and also older females, and they'll spend very, very little time investigating other females of their own age class and reproductive status, whereas males are the complete opposite. Uh, they go and spend all their time investigating females that are reproductively <laughs> active and no time investigating anything else. <laughs> okay, but let's say I was wrong in my methods, and I really should have been analyzing it in that way, and this is the right territory. These are the correct territories that badgers are marking out. How then would their movement, uh, how then is their movement relating to these territories? Well, that's something I was able to test with my uh, RFID component. So that, that determines their above ground location over time at a very, very high frequency. So essentially, whenever a badger is moving, I can detect where it's moving to. And that looks a bit like this uh, when I get those raw data back. And each of these rows here is a different set where I've put um, a radio detector. And this is one animal over the course of a 24-hour period. And as you can see, there's a lot of movement. It's being picked up all over the place. And this is one animal being picked up at eight different sets over the course of one night. <laughs> If you map that uh, out uh, spatially, you get a picture like this. Uh, so this is two animals from the same group. Uh, one is a, this one here is a two-year-old male, and the one on the right is an eight-year-old female. And um, two animals from the same group are showing very, very different patterns of movement, and they're crossing what should be a territorial border um, quite regularly. And if you do that for all the different animals in my group, uh, you'll see uh, these gray areas on the back are those um, bait marked territories, and these um, circular uh, areas above mapped onto that are the animals' different home ranges. And blue is for the boys and pink is for the girls. And you'll notice the pink ones tend to be restricted to their own territory, and that's what you see here, whereas the males tend to overlap multiple different territories, and also multiple different males from multiple different groups. And that's the exact same pattern of um, badger distribution that you see when badgers are at low densities. And so when um, badgers are at low densities, you typically have females holding discrete territories and males overlapping multiple different females. And that's when badgers are at about a density of one and a half or so per square kilometer. In the UK, we've got about 25 badgers per square kilometer. In Whiteham, I've got 35 badgers per square kilometer. So their densities are hugely, I mean, they're 25 to 35 times higher. But you get that same pattern. It's just stacked on top of itself, where you get females with discrete ranges, but then another female stacked on top. And so you see that same pattern of territoriality, just amplified. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, it's the same, same pattern of territoriality that they show uh, at low densities. And so they're behaving in the same way that they behave on the continent at low densities. Just there's so many of them here that they're living together in these burrows. Um, and so these movement patterns don't seem to match up well with that concept of active territorial defense, where um, territories are marked off by a latrine and a path that are keep out signs. And pros uh, yeah, trespassers will be prosecuted. Uh, but you'll notice as well, there's a huge gap right here. And that's because that's the period when the badgers have moved below ground. And traditionally, traditional technologies like the radio waves cannot pick these animals up below ground. And it's a period of time when uh, we would just say the animal's below ground, uh, we can't follow it, uh, and it's a gap in the data. And the assumption typically is that they're relatively inactive below ground and tend not to move around. And so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the components of this technology is a mag magneto-inductive component. And that allows me to follow the animals below ground uh, with an accuracy of about 30 centimeters and a frequency of once every three seconds. So huge increase to the accuracy of about a meter or so that old 
technologies used by triangulation, and also a huge increase in the frequency with which I uh, sample. Based on old technology, you tend to do it about once a day around lunchtime, or you tended to do it if you're really ambitious about three or four times a day. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, three to four times or one time a day versus once every three seconds. And what I look, see when I map out their patterns of set use, uh, as opposed to their patterns of above ground use, is a very, very different picture of vector society. And in fact, those two different members from the same group now look like two different members of the same group. And if you compare again those home ranges, these are their above ground home ranges, to their patterns of set use, their below ground, underground home ranges, different animals from different groups are then restricted to those sets within those territories. And so, yes, badger society is definitely centered around their sets. Um, and I think that those territorial borders above ground, however, um, are a bit of uh, a misnomer, definitely. But not only am I able to tell whether or not they're in the set, I'm also able to follow them below ground with high accuracy, as I said, 30 centimeters. And so to do that, uh, I deployed different antenna, and they uh, work together to pick out uh, where the badger is. Each of these comes with a bit of a signal strength, and then I run it through a program, and it um, looks at the different signal strength with, e with respect to each uh, antenna, and essentially triangulates where the animal is. And as I mentioned, you get an accuracy of about 30 centimeters, and you also get that in three dimensions. And they tend, this, this technology itself on its own tends to work for about a year, sampling again once every three seconds, and that's about five billion data points for each animal. Huge increase in resolution to one data point per day. It's actually a 55,000 fold increase in our ability to monitor them below ground. And so you can use that, uh, those different positional data, to then uh, map out what the set looks like below ground. And you can pick out the different chambers, the different tunnels that link up the chambers together, the tunnels that link up to the above ground environment, and then you can map out, as I said, those different chambers within the set um, and use statistical techniques to then try and find out how badgers are using their environment below ground. And so I, I use something what's called a Markov chain, uh, which looks at the probability of either staying in the same state, so staying in the same chamber, or moving to a different state, moving to a different chamber. And I compared what that, you know, difference in increase in frequency of sampling meant. So if I had sampled using traditional technology uh, these animals once per day at noon, this is the pattern of set use that I would have seen. Not much of the set is used, two chambers are predominantly used, and there's not much switching back and forth. I tend to move chambers once every about three to four days, um, and yeah, not, not much movement. And that's exactly the pattern that you see in other studies that sampled at that frequency. But just by increasing the frequency to once per hour over a 24 hour period, you see a huge increase in the number of chambers that are used, huge increase in the number of uh, movements that are occurring, um, and a totally different image of badger life. But if you increase once per minute, and again once every three seconds, it's just a totally different image of what's going on below ground than when you sampled at that really, really low frequency. And actually, when I calculated how much movement was occurring, Previous studies captured less than 1% of what the movement that was going on below ground. Now to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, it's the difference between this, a still image, and this, a video. And so this is three animals over the course of the day, sorry, four animals. That cyan one is a female, the rest are males. And this is at a period when they should be inactive. Now those three males will have realized that that female has got up. <laughs> and they hop over to a different chamber and follow her. And the party keeps going. And it gets a little crowded. And they tend to shift over. And then six o'clock rolls around, sun goes down, and they all get up and leave. And that's that's what that less than one percent of movement is. It's a huge increase in our ability to follow these animals below ground and monitor them below ground. And uh, what I actually found is, no, they don't stay in the same chamber on a night-to-night -night basis. They move around a lot. On average, they'll move chambers about eight times a day, but up to 19 times a day, they're moving to and picking a new chamber. 
Uh, most of this does happen at night, um, so that's during sundown periods. That's when the badger is um, either waking up and moving to uh, go out and feed. It's when it's coming back and taking these breaks, these rests, or it's when it's coming back uh, at the end of the night uh, for its long uh, rest during the day. But um, there's definitely a lot of underground movement during the day as well. They're not only sleeping. And over the course of a 13-day period for four animals, I found uh, 22 instances of daytime movement, 22 instances of that hopping back and forth over 13 days. Now, to compare that to a previous study, there was one that looked at badgers over the course of 2015 days, and this was much more animals, greater number of animals than uh, the four that I looked at, and they found two instances of movement during the day. Um, and so that was why we were assuming inactive, uh, in an inactivity below ground. But I'm also able to find out, you know, you'll, you'll have noticed earlier, I said badgers take a lot of breaks. Uh, my activity data was suggesting that badgers are taking a lot of breaks over the course of the night. Um, and they tend to return to the set about every two to two and a half hours. Uh, but because I can follow them below ground, I can also say they're going back to the set, yes, but where are they going within the set uh, during those breaks? And so those short breaks that happen um, during the night tend to be restricted to those outer chambers. So these are going to be the first chamber that a badger comes across as it's moving below ground. Um, but when it goes below ground, so this is during the night uh, for a very short rest of about 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, but when it's moving below ground for that long daytime period, they tend to move into those deeper chambers that tend to be warmer, uh, and they also tend to congregate more in those areas. And so there's definitely a difference uh, in the function of, of the different chambers uh, for the badgers. Uh, so the take-home message from all that is, I think badger social dynamics are far more complex than some of these textbooks have originally suggested. And territorial, I think, is a really oversimplification of what's actually a very, very rich social behavior, range of social behaviors. Um, but most definitely, sets do play a central role in their behavior, in their social lives, and their societies are most definitely centered around their sets. Uh, so thanks a lot, and I hope you did learn something from that. <laughs> And uh, if you have any questions, please.